very first one that we're going to be looking at is a person's sex. Now, biologically speaking, there are only two sexes. Okay, biologically speaking. So, when we're looking at determining whether or not they are male or female, okay, you're going to look at two things. You're going to look at the skull, and you're going to look at the pelvis. Now, you should have already done the labeling activity and taken the, the check on that. Otherwise, you wouldn't be able to open up this. <clears throat> So when I talk about these things, you should be familiar about what I'm saying. So looking at these characteristics, okay, um, we, we see that there are prominent features in both of these that are specifically you, um, seen in either males or females, usually speaking. There, there can be some exceptions for this. But... Um, Let's look at the pelvic area first, okay? So, <clears throat> when we're looking at a female's pelvis, okay, they tend to have a wider... Now, remember that they're the ones who have children, so they have to make sure that their organs are situated and their bone structure is made to where they can actually push a baby out of this pelvic region. So their pelvic region is going to be a lot wider... Um, they have a more um, circular pelvic opening, which if you remember from your labeling activity, is this part right here. Um, you can see that their sacrum and coccyx have to be pushed out wide, or, so they're pushed backwards. So if we're looking at, you know, and here's their sacrum and their coccyx. Okay, a male's can sit. Here's her leg. Okay, a male's sacrum and coccyx can sit further in this way into the pelvic opening here because I don't have to worry about holding a baby right there. But females naturally are going to have a coccyx and a pelvic region that goes, that pushes outward. And what this does is it, it, puts a lot of pressure on their back, which is why a lot of women have back problems, especially when they are pregnant. And um, this creates a very, like, circular-looking hole here. So, like, this isn't very prominent because it's pushed backwards, so you can't really see it when you look through the hole. Whereas a male's sacrum and coccyx are going to be pushed forward, and so it creates this kind of heart-shaped pelvic opening, which is what I'm going to be talking about in a second. So that's what I'm talking about. Anywho's, so, <clears throat> so this is a, to make room for the birthing canal. They also have, um, a shorter pelvic region. And the main thing here is that they have something called a subcubic angle. That is greater than 90 degrees. And so what that means, okay, the pubic arch right here is that triangular shaped thing. And because a female's pelvic, I mean, you can see here, their actual pelvic region is like butterfly shaped here, all right, on both of them. But a female's, because she has to have a wider opening, her pelvic region will sit <clears throat> closer in, which causes the pubic arch, okay, right here, to be very wide, okay? So this is what they call the subpubic angle right here, down, down on this one right here. <coughs> so, contrasting that, a male's 
pelvic region is going to be narrower. Narrow pelvic region. They also have a longer pelvis because it doesn't have to be as wide. So you see here the, the length of it, whereas this one is very short. Okay, they have what we call a heart-shaped opening in their pelvic region, so the heart-shaped pelvic opening. That's what I was talking about with the sacrum and the coccyx sitting in there. So it occupies a lot of the space in that pelvic opening and then their subpubic angle because their hips are narrower is less than 90 degrees so remember I said that this is what we're talking about the subpubic angle I'm sorry with the pelvic opening and then this is what we're talking about the subpubic angle so it's important for you to be able to recognize these and be able to know what I'm talking about when I say subpubic angle when I say pubic symphysis. All right, so because females, <clears throat> their body has to become very elastic. Um, during the birthing process, their, sub, their, their pelvic region actually separates, okay? So we talked about this in the labeling activity. That is your pubic symphysis. It's a piece of cartilage that keeps the bottom half of your pelvic together. During pregnancy, women will emit this hormone called elastin, it makes all of their cartilage very elastic, so it makes them very nimble and limber. And um, during the birthing process, this actually breaks and it widens, so it pushes both of these outward to make more room. And then once the baby is out, it'll come back together and it'll reseal itself. So females who have had children, you can actually tell because they will have scarring Around this region here, they'll also have scarring around their pubic symphysis. And because it occupies, the baby occupies this space, you will see scratches and scrapes along this area from the birthing process. So it's, it's easy for um, a forensic anthropologist to tell if a female has the given birth already. Okay, let me go back one. Take a look at these skulls here. Okay, so the next part we're going to talk about is the skulls. Okay, now you may think it'd be it is pretty easy to tell. Okay, females tend to have a smaller skull. Uh, it has less pronounced areas. So when I say less pronounced brow ridge. Talking about this right here. So you can see in this picture that the female does not have a lot of bone projecting right here versus the male that does. Okay, that has to do with the, and all of these features have to do with the fact that females produce more estrogen than they do testosterone and males produce more testosterone than they do estrogen. They both produce both, but estrogen is higher in, in females and testosterone is higher than males. So that is a secondary, these are both secondary sex characteristics that happen after puberty is finished. So during puberty, this is what we're talking about. We're not just talking about external ones like boobs or getting a fuller butt or filling out muscular. We're also talking about the bone structure is going to change a lot. So a female's width, she, I mean, you can tell just by looking at a 10-year-old girl that she has the body of a 10-year-old boy. It's narrow and everything, skinny. But then as she gets older, you'll see that your body's going to change. And I know that women hate it, but, you know, your hips are going to get wider. You're going to start holding a lot more fat than you used to. And those are just characteristics of having higher estrogen levels. So get over it. Um, anyways, so they're going to have a less pronounced brow ridge and a less uh, smaller brow ridge and mastoid process. It's that bone on the side of your jaw. Okay. And they're going to have a more rounded jawline.
Okay, and then males tend to have exactly the opposite. So a male is usually larger in the skull itself. Uh, more pronounced brow ridge. Mastoid process. And they usually have a square jawline. So I will show you what I mean by like triangular versus squared jawline in just a second. Let's see if I have a picture here. Okay, so let me show you what I mean by uh, several of these things. So they're going to have a, so this is a male and this is a female. Okay, I can immediately tell because of several reasons. Okay, males tend to have a very pronounced zygomatic process. Okay, that's the cheekbone area. But you can see here the brow ridge. This is what I'm talking about right here. That brow ridge and this is smooth. So smooth brow ridge is the female, pronounced brow ridge is a male, okay? Males also tend to have a squared jawline here. Females tend to have a rounded one, okay? It also is a lot more narrow, like it can be sort of, I don't know, like not really, I don't know, it's just not pronounced, okay? And then this is the mastoid process, the thing that I'm circling right now. You can tell that the mass, so the mastoid process is something that is going to hook a bunch of your neck muscles to help your head move. Males have bigger necks, they have bigger bones, they have stronger necks, which means they have to have bigger bones in order to attach those muscles to. So this mastoid process is a lot larger in males than it is in females. Okay, and um, they also tend to have just in general smoother skull, like in general, because they don't have to have as, a, they also, like this back here, they tend to not have a pronounced occipital lobe either. Okay, the female one is very smooth, whereas the male one has a bunch of ridges in it. And this is honestly just due to the fact that males have bigger muscles, and so they have to have bigger muscle attachment sites for it. So that's, that's how we tell the difference between a male and a female for a skull. Okay, this is a handout I gave you. It's a um, pretty much a just overall summary of the skeletal features. Um, you will need to memorize all of these and you should be able to look at a skull or look at a pelvic bone structure and be able to tell me if they are male or female. So right now, you are going... So here's the problem, though, that we have with this, okay? Males and females are so because they're of their genetics. And genetics will say that males need to produce more testosterone than estrogen. But this doesn't happen until they are reaching puberty, Okay, so puberty here is the, is the key to being able to determine male and female. Okay, so if we have prepubescent skeletons, okay, it tends to make it a lot harder to determine sex because they may not be showing... those secondary sex characteristics that, you know, men and women show after they hit puberty. So, um, there's, this becomes harder, all right, for whatever reason, it could be that they, it also has, there's other things that could make this hard too, but, um, essentially it's either a lack of secondary sex characteristics Another one that could throw you for a loop is if um, somebody has been on steroids, 
okay? Especially if they were starting young, okay? Um, if they are just not making enough estrogen or testosterone, so they still look sort of male and sort of female, but they're not showing any sex characteristics, that could be hard too. Okay, um, and so like I said, um, another thing that's unrelated to all of this, but you have to remember, is that females who have given birth will have scarring on their pelvic bone. And their pubic symphysis, okay, which is that piece that, remember, comes off, so it's the... Due to tearing and reattaching. Yay for childbirth. 